Hi everyone and welcome to this Ask the Experts webcast on the urinary challenges of prostate cancer. On behalf of the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia, thank you very much for joining us. For many men, urinary side effects after prostate cancer treatment can be quite challenging. So over the next hour, our panel will go through the causes of urinary issues and examine a range of treatments to help overcome side effects such as leaking and difficulty emptying. We'll go through things like common side effects and causes, strategies for overcoming discomfort, managing leaks and choosing the right treatment for you, seeking support and affording access to care, and knowing who to go to and who to turn to. And upon registration, we asked you for some of your questions and we've used them as a bit of a guide as to how to structure our discussion tonight. And we'll also be able to specifically answer some of them as well. So while we wait for more people and more of you to join us online and get ready to listen to the discussion, let me introduce myself and our panel. So my name is Ricardo Gonsalves. I'm a presenter on SBS and the finance editor for the network. And I've also moderated a number of these webinars for the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia, including Prostate Cancer 101 and Prostate Cancer, Sex, Intimacy and Relationships. And you can see all of those videos on the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia website on the online community page in the videos section. So you can do that at any time. This webcast though will be a little bit different compared to the others that we've done because we are adhering to social distancing measures because of the COVID-19 outbreak, which means our guests aren't here physically in the studio, but they are online on location and combined our guests tonight have more than 100 years of experience and they include Dr Jane Crow who has worked as a GP in suburban Melbourne for over 30 years and is a casual lecturer at University of Melbourne. In 2011 she started working as a prostate cancer GP as well. She currently works at the Australian Prostate Centre in North Melbourne which is a multidisciplinary clinic for men and supports men on androgen deprivation therapy. We've also got Dr Peter Heathcote, who is a urologist with a special interest in cancer of the prostate. He's worked in rural Queensland before gaining experience in the UK and Canada. With his colleagues at the Brisbane Urology Clinic, he was able to establish the first robotic prostatectomy program in Queensland after training in the US. He's also published scientific papers on prostate cancer. Also joining us tonight is Thomas Harris. He is a men's health physiotherapist working closely with a number of urologists. He graduated from Griffith University with a Bachelor of Exercise Science and a Master of Physiotherapy and is a curator of his own website whilst consulting out of Target Physio in Brisbane and online. And our fourth guest and panellist is Kerry Sontoro, a registered nurse for over 20 years. She has completed a Masters of Nursing practice, specialising in neurological and continence nursing. She is the current prostate cancer specialist nurse at Flinders Medical Centre in South Australia. So welcome to our four panellists. We've got them here for the next hour and we've got some uh, pretty interesting and topical uh, subjects and questions to get through. So maybe if we start with Dr Jane, Dr Jane, let's maybe do a bit of a 101. What exactly is incontinence? Incontinence is basically loss of bladder control. Uh, there's urine leakage, it's involuntary, which can be mild, uh, admittant, temporary or it can be full on total incontinence and permanent so the whole range of severity. Uh, Peter can you go maybe into a bit more detail um, Dr Jane mentioned some of them there but the varying levels and the different types of incontinence one can have and more importantly I guess at what point does it become a concern?
Now, Peter, we're having trouble hearing you. I think you may have your microphone on mute. So if you can try to unmute your microphone, uh, we'll be able to hear you. Peter, I think we've got you there now. Peter, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Peter, we'll get back to it then. We, we've got all, we, this is all new doing this technology, trying some new things. Peter, run through again what are some of the varying levels or the different types of incontinence one can have and at what point does it become a concern? Well, the two, the two basic types of incontinence are the stress incontinence, which occurs with coughing, sneezing, uh, getting up from a chair, or urgency incontinence, which is associated with the urge to pass and uh, often involves uh, just not quite getting to the toilet in time and leakage uh, uh, at embarrassing places uh, which you can't control. By and large, urgency incontinence is due to bladder overactivity and stress incontinence due to weakness of the sphincters that control the urine. You can have a mixture of both, and that's common. When does it become a problem? Well, it's entirely the patient's prerogative, really. Uh, and all of our assessments are based on the degree of bother and inconvenience that our patients experience, and that drives uh, how we investigate and how we manage and treat. So, Peter, just to follow on from that, typically, at what point does a patient do something about it? When do they initially see their GP? Well, uh, it really does depend on how inconvenienced they, they are and how it's affecting their lifestyle. Uh, if it's uh, early on after surgery or radiotherapy, they're often well prepared and they may have severe leakage, but they're not uh, overly concerned or bothered by it because they're receiving good support from the nursing staff and from the physiotherapists and from the general practitioners. And often, uh, if it's only mild leakage, say just 10 or 20 mils a day or a small pad a day, often a patient just needs reassurance that there's nothing nasty, that it, it can be part of the, their course. And... Um, all they then is reassurance. So it does, it varies enormously from patient to patient. Obviously, if you have an episode of urgency in cops where you wet your uh, clothes in public, that's very distressing and would lead to uh, uh, urgent seeking of uh, help. Jane, I think we may have a slide for this next part, but can you run through what causes incontinence? Certainly. So I thought I would start off with how the urinary system normally works. So I prepared a slide earlier. So if my slide could come up, please. It's a hand-drawn picture. It's the sort of picture I, I draw for patients. Can you see it or I yep. can't see it? Jane, we've got it up on screen. Okay. So, okay, I can't see what I'm talking about, but there's basically the two kidneys, uh, the, and then the tubes, which the ureters drain into the bladder, um, and underneath the bladder sits the prostate, um, and through the prostate there's a little tube that runs from the bladder through the prostate and out through the penis called the urethra. So what normally happens is the kidney makes the urine, it goes down the ureter. It, the, the function of the bladder is to store the urine and also to uh, contract and expel the urine when you're ready. So the uh, bladder is, is relaxed, it gradually fills up. As it fills up, the bladder, if you the urge, I'm getting the bladder, and as the more it fills, the, the more you need to go to the toilet, you then go to the toilet and the sphincters open and you release the urine. That's how it should normally all work. So with, with uh, the stress incontinence that uh, Peter was talking about, that is the stress that now, stress on the bladder, which might be um, the coughing, sneezing, standing, exercising, straining. Uh, and that is where the, the little sphincters, sphincters are like little clamps above the prostate and below the prostate. 
Um, and the blowpipe is the, the pelvic floor. It's like a little sling at the, in the pelvic floor. It keeps everything in place in the, the bowel and the bladder. So the stress incontinence is when there's been disruption to the clamps. And so when you cough or sneeze, you can't sort of, the clamps don't work and the, and the urine escapes. And that often happens with, with surgery. Um, uh, so that's, that's the, the stress, um, oh, sorry, yeah. Stress incontinence. Um, women get it after childbirth, but men after often after prostate surgery. And then there's the urge incontinence, and as I said, the the bladder is quite a relaxed organ, and it gradually fills up, and you gradually get the need to go. But with urge incontinence, the, the bladder, which is a muscular pouch, uh, becomes very tricky, and uh, so before it's ready to empty, a small amount of urine might make you want to expel. It doesn't give you much time, so. Um, you know, you get this urge and you need to get there quickly and off, often you will leak, you won't get there. And that's an urge incontinence. And the things that can cause that, it can be um, infection, uh, radiation can do that. Um, sometimes if there's any obstruction to the flow sort of below the bladder, that can cause it to be irritable and, and twitchy. Uh, it can be due to anything in the, in the bladder itself, like cancer or stones. Um, constipation can, can also make it twitchy. Uh, and some medications can make it um, twitchy and, and urge, and make you make you have an urgency. Um, and there's I've, there's two other kind of um, incontinence. It's not as common in prostate cancer surgery, but um, there's the overflow, and that's when the, the 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 bladder just doesn't learn to contract. It just builds up slowly, slowly, slowly. It gets so full that it just leaks away, and that's often with with neurological problems or if some of a benign enlargement of the bladder or some medications. And then there's a frozen child practice, and I suppose I think the functional side of a man is, is, is un unable to get to the toilet in time just due to severe arthritis, severe back pain, um, immobility problems or strokes, something, he just can't physically get there, then that can, he just can't get there in time and he'll, he'll leak. And then, of course, there's a mixture of all of the above. So, so Peter, we'll, we'll go into more detail about about why we're here, about how prostate cancer and I guess prostate cancer surgery can impact urinary issues. But one of the questions we had directly was, can a biopsy cause incontinence? Peter, can it? No, no, it shouldn't, uh, is the short answer. Uh, of course, the most important predictor of problems with urinary incontinence after any procedure is what your urinary control and continence is like before the procedure. Uh, so it may be that if you're having a lot of troubles with urgency or stress incontinence and then you have a biopsy, it becomes more pronounced. But there's no specific reason that a biopsy should cause incontinence unless you have retention of urine uh, and then you have, as Jane mentioned, overflow incontinence of urine. But that's usually pretty painful in, a, uh, in, a, in the acute setting. Thomas, if we can spend some time with you, since we're talking about anatomy really and the basics first of all, can you tell us what is the pelvic floor and why we need to know about it? <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Ricardo. So the pelvic floor, um, the typical model was like a sling. So there was often a lot of men and people would refer to it as one single muscle. Um, it's actually a combination of skeletal and smooth muscles. So uh, I think we're bringing up a slide if it's up. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Brian Stafford and Paul Hodges and their team at UQ for allowing me to share this slide. But you should see uh, a common, you should see a bladder at the top and then coming down through the urethra and through the penis. And below that is the internal urethral sphincter that Jane was just referring to. And below that's the prostate. And then we have three pelvic floor muscles. And these are kind of where the, the bigger, bolder arrows are. <clears throat> so the one, the first one closest to the prostate we can see is pterorectalis, which is also involved um, in bowel motions and was one of the primary muscles that we used to work with. Below that, we've got a secondary um, striated urethral sphincter, which is one of the primary pelvic floor muscles we now talk about. And then another one which is involved um, in urinary continence, maintaining continence, is uh, bulbocarbonosis, which is down the bottom and, and kind of lies down at the base of the penis. 
Now, what, what is their role and, and how do you activate it? Yeah, so great question. So if that slide's still there, you can see that those, those muscle groups work in different ways. Um, and so our primary, our understanding's changed a lot over the last probably six to seven years um, and that we now move away from trying to activate puborectalis, commonly referred to as, as our bum muscle. Um, and we now try and move more towards activating and trying to strengthen up that lower sphincter, that striated um, urethral sphincter and bulbo carbonosis. And again, the team at UQ um, have kind of been leading the way here. And they did a couple of a study around different cues and what gets the most activation in and around that striated urethral sphincter. And the number one cue for men was talking about trying to retract the penis. So thinking base of the penis and trying to draw it in slowly and softly through there. And then the second one was um, also thinking about trying to either lift the scrotum up, so walking in the cold water and trying to lift it up at the last second, or trying to stop the flow of urine. Um, the issue of stopping the flow of urine is sometimes men will start too hard and too soon and they'll activate more of their bum muscle than the striated urethral sphincter that we're trying to target. Don't know about anyone else, but I feel like when we talk about things, you, these things, you automatically start trying to tense in that area too. So maybe can you tell us um, what type of exercises you can do to, to strengthen the pelvic floor, right? And when should they be started? Even, you know, even for those people that um, haven't gone through prostate cancer surgery, is it something that one needs to think about? Yes, it is. So um, we, we have, we have there's a, there is a population of men out in the community that as they get older, so men are quite, uh, we're lucky in that we don't give birth, so we don't have a large strain put onto our pelvic floor generally. Um, men who might have a chronic cough, um, being overweight, uh, may potentially develop weakness of these shrinks um, from yeah, repetitive coffee or carrying more weight onto the pelvic floor. Um, in terms of the question around when should they be started, they can be started really at any time. Um, the biggest problem is adherence, so most men won't do these unless they have an issue. Um, in terms of prostate cancer surgery and preparing for surgery, Joe, Joe Milos, another, Milos, another Western Australian, uh, just released a study, and her study was five weeks of pre-op, and, and that's what we try and get typically is four to six weeks of pre-op training because we're, we're thinking of it more as a learning a new skill. Um, it's not so much just pumping some weights, kind of get, getting it going. It's, it's learning a new skill of how to find these muscles, how to activate them, and then progressively making it harder from there. Because I guess you can't physically see it if you were, say, doing an arm workout, how do you know if you're doing it correctly? How do you know if you can feel those exercises doing the right job? Yeah, great. Um, so we can we can palpate to a degree. So we can touch, um, our, we can place our fingers just behind the scrotum in that perineal area, so that, that space of skin between the scrotum um, and, and, and the anus, and we can feel muscles moving down there. Um, we want to be also touching around our abdomen to make sure that those muscles aren't kicking in at the same time. So we want the lower part working, not the upper part. Um, in clinic, so <clears throat> men that are referred to a physio typically will do an ultrasound, um, either through the tummy or down behind the, behind the scrotum, so a transperineal ultrasound, and that allows us to view those muscle groups and see what's activating well and what's maybe working too hard. The, the last option or the other option is that uh, men are somewhat lucky in that we have external genitalia. So you can actually stand in front of a mirror um, or stand somewhere and start trying to, thinking about retracting the penis. And you can see some movement typically at the base of the penis to give a guide as to whether we're doing it well. At what point can these exercises be painful? And if they are, what, what should one do? Yeah, so sometimes we'll have men complain about some pain, typically um, straight after the biopsy. Um, and, and often it's uh, doing them a little bit too hard, too fast and too soon. So they might be just activating everything. 
and particularly if they're activating the ab abdominal muscle, their obliques and abs at the same time, that downward pressure can then put more pressure um, in around the pelvic floor and, and the prostate. They, they shouldn't really be painful. Um, and if they are, we, we generally recommend having a couple of days rest and then starting again quite slowly and softly and just building back up from there. And just before I move on to Jane, Thomas, is there anything that can be done to prevent incontinence in the first place? Um, I suppose, yeah, so living a, being as healthy as we can, so not carrying a lot of weight, um, and particularly coupled with a cough, it are things that will generally help uh, help reduce our risk of developing some stress incontinence. Um, and I'll leave that rest of it to Jane. Okay. <laughs> Jane, um, we've spoken about the bladder, we've spoken about the pelvic floor. Now let's talk about the prostate, right, before we talk about prostate cancer surgery. What is the role of the prostate within the urinary function? Um, well, the main function of the prostate is to make fluid uh, to nourish and transport sperm, um, ejaculate. So, the main function of the prostate with respect to the urinary system is mainly its anatomy, um, and that's the main thing. So because the um, prostate is below the bladder and the urethra, the, the outlet tube runs through the prostate, it, uh, it hugs that tube. So if the prostate is quite happy, uh, there's nothing wrong with it, and it's the normal size and functioning normally, then it won't have any function with the, the urinary system. But when the when the bladder uh, when the prostate starts to play up, that's when we start to get urine symptoms. Just by nature of it, it can um, hug that uh, uh, um, surround that tube with them too tightly, cause an obstruction of the urine, and that's when you might get the um, uh, frequency of the urine and hard to start the the, the um, stream and hard to stop and going more frequently, and it just does, does start to impact on the, the bladder system. Uh, Kerry, if I can draw you into the conversation now too, and um, being a prostate cancer nurse, how does um, a nurse help keep men informed about the risks of urinary incontinence before a decision on prostate cancer treatment? So, Ricardo, a key role of the prostate cancer specialist nurse is to be a primary point of contact the man, his partner and family following um, a cancer diagnosis. You know, in my role, um, that I have some dedicated time to spend with the man and his family to provide some counselling around diagnosis and also to discuss all the treatment options that are available and what that may mean in relation to quality of life outcomes for the man. How we manage prostate cancer is not clear cut and not everyone is suitable for all treatments. So ensuring a man understands his diagnosis. At the information appointment, I encourage the man that they might have so we can talk about that it's done in a nice, quiet, private space and that there's an adequate amount of time put aside for the appointment so that they don't feel rushed. I think it's really important provide the man and his partner and family with some written resources um, to take away from the appointment so they can reflect and look back on them. And I also refer them to, to some online resources as well. So realistic when they're explaining to men about the potential urinary incontinence risks associated with treatment because incontinence can have such a significant impact on a man's quality of life. So making sure they clearly understand the potential urinary problems that come from treatment is really important because it often will help guide them um, around a decision for what treatment they choose. Kerry, we've had a, a couple of glitches uh, with the audio on, on your answer. So if I re-ask you a, a similar question uh, in the next few minutes, th that's the reason why, uh, just because we didn't hear the answer properly. But in the meantime, we might move on to our, our next topic, which is, um, you know, we've spoken about uh, pre-surgery. So as we approach surgery as an, as an option, you know, what happens? So Jane, a, a, as a GP, what is your role in the process, especially leading up to surgery? 
leading up to surgery. Um, well, I am uh, one of a, I'm a team member of one of many players in this team. Um, there's often the urologists, uh, the prostate cancer or you incontinence nurses um, and the pelvic floor physiotherapists. I mean, they are the experts when it comes to continence. So my role is to uh, talk to them, to educate them about what to expect, um, uh, look at anything that might be impacting on his continence. I mean, as, as Thomas was saying, um, uh, if you've got a cough or if you're overweight, I uh, think we can try and help, I help that side. It might help reduce his, uh, his burden of, of bladder problems. Um, so I'll assess him, I'll do any tests if he does have any continence issues. I'll, I'll test his urine and um, maybe arrange ultrasound. And, and then I'm going to refer to the best possible people. As, like there's people on the panel, you probably can't get much better. Um, and coordinate their care um, uh, and just monitor, see how he's going, um, work out what his goals are, how he's how has he coping? How's his partner and wife coping? Uh, Looking at the whole picture. Kerry. Uh, as a nurse, again, where can men and their partners access information about incontinence before and after surgery? So the Prostate Cancer Foundation website has a number of resources available to men and their families. The Understand series is one of these booklets is um, really specific around urinary problems following prostate cancer treatment. Uh, men and their families can also access information through the Cancer Council website uh, and also the Continence Foundation of Australia, which is a national organisation in Australia. Uh, they also have some excellent um, online and printable resources. Uh, all of these foundations also have hotlines, which means men and their partners or family um, can access, um, you know, someone at the other end of a phone call, which is really... Um, sometimes men just want someone that might be able to offer some words of support and advice. OK. Uh, Peter, I'd like to spend a fair bit of time with you now um, because and, and talk about the actual surgery and, and what happens post it, right? So when the prostate is removed during surgery, I guess how does that part of the body look and how does that lead to possible side effects? Well, the problem is that, uh, as Jane has pointed out, the prostate wraps around the first part of the urethra as it's leaving the bladder and sits on the uh, sphincter muscles and the pelvic floor. So it's in a very tight little space. So invariably, some of the sphincter muscles that control urine are removed and or injured during the surgery. So. Uh, we uh, take utmost care in removing the prostate, but inevitably there will be some damage to those sphincter muscles. Also, when we operate, uh, the neck of the bladder is irritated and inflamed, and so that will often cause a lot of urinary symptoms. But thankfully, uh, time is a great healer, and so Whilst nearly all men do have a degree of incontinence early after surgery, uh, even if we're able to achieve a meticulous dissection and good nerve sparing and preservation of function, uh, nearly all men do have leakage of urine, uh, but thankfully that mostly takes up in the first three to six months. Can I just re-emphasise what both Jane and Kerry said Preparation, uh, and Tom said, it's, preparation is really important here. Um, I often say to my patients, look, think of your surgery as grand final day. Uh, you don't just walk in and play the game. You prepare for it. You get fit. You lose weight. You go on walks. You do your pelvic floor exercises beforehand. So you're starting up at a better place before the surgery. When... You speak to a patient about to undergo this type of surgery. Is there an indication as to, a, I guess, a percentage or the likelihood that
that there may be some serious incontinence issues depending on the type of prostate surgery you have? Of course. So the, we look at the predictors of incontinence before surgery and the most important predictor of problems with incontinence uh, before surgery is what your performance uh, and any incontinence you may have uh, before the operation. So uh, that is often linked with age as well. So if your age is over 70 or if you have 75 or if you have a lot of frequency or urgency already, you're going to be more at risk. But in general terms, I tell my patients that nearly all of them will need to wear a pad or several pads a day for the first three months. By six months, three quarters of men have thrown their pads away. And by 12 months, over 90% of men have thrown their pads away. Now, no matter how good the surgery is, in one to 2% of men, uh, their anatomy uh, is such that uh, they will have severe leakage and will need more intervention. Can we maybe go back one step? Um, we, we've spoken a, a about, you know, uh, the potential side effects. What, what, what is the most common side effect and how long can those side effects last after surgery? Oh, the, the, there, are some, there are general side effects of surgery that occur, but there's no doubt that urinary incontinence is the commonest side effect. I don't actually call it a side effect. I, I think it's a consequence of surgery. And we've got to approach it that way. And with the help of um, our physiotherapists, our general practitioners, uh, and our prostate cancer nurses, we prepare our patients and their family as best we can and tailor uh, their treatment and get them fit before the surgery. But there's no doubt that the commonest complication after surgery is incontinence of urine. You mentioned there the, the time frame of when one can throw the, the, the pad away, right? So that offers some, some um, optimistic outlook on that. But how common are permanent side effects? Oh, very, very uncommon. After 12 to 18 months, well over 90% of men uh, have no further incontinence or may have a little slight leakage. Remember also that if you survey men over the age of 70 in the, in the uh, general population who have not had any surgery, 20 to 25% of those men have urinary leakage. And interestingly, we've recently published data last year from our patients who'd had surgery that after 12 to 18 months, often their bladder function is better than it was before the surgery, but it takes a while. You know, uh, surgeons cut, but patients heal. It does take time to recover. There's only a very small proportion of men, one to two percent, maybe three percent, who have severe ongoing leakage that need either a sling placed or an artificial sphincter placed. But we don't rush into that because uh, we know, as I've already said, uh, you can get uh, improvement without those uh, procedures in the first 12 to 18 months. In the meantime, supportive care, pelvic floor physio, and there are some medications to try and quieten the bladder down too. We'll get to... Um, we'll, we'll, our we'll, listeners may be aware of that. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to some of those medications in a few moments. Um, but, Peter, this might be a good time to, to uh, address one of the questions we had directly, which is what's the difference between chronic and acute urinary retention? Uh, well, it's just as the name implies, chronic urinary retention happens over a long period of time with stretching of the bladder and is usually relatively uh, painless and doesn't cause a lot of symptoms. Acute urinary retention happens immediately, suddenly, sometimes after um, 
uh, a procedure in the hospital uh, or sometimes uh, after excessive alcohol or constipation or an operation, and that's usually quite painful. Thomas, if I can come back to you, um, Peter was mentioning earlier about how one needs to prepare before um, surgery. Um, is there a connection or how great is the connection between general fit fitness and incontinence after surgery? And when we say general fitness, what does that general fitness look like? Yeah, good question. Um, <clears throat> so general fitness, I suppose, uh, you can measure it in many different ways. As physios, um, we like to come back to the government's uh, national guidelines for, for physical activity and exercise, which is about 150 minutes of moderate <coughs> intensity exercise a week. Um, what's a moderate intensity? So that is getting a little bit puffy. So not being able to hold a, a fantastic conversation with someone that you're exercising with. So getting the heart rate up a bit, getting a bit hot and sweaty and a little bit puffy. Um, a lot of people, particularly as they get older, will, will say, I'm active and they're in the garden. And that's great, but sometimes it's not enough intensity. Um, in terms of how it affects surgery, there was a good study uh, a couple of years ago which showed that men who were overweight but active, um, their, their side effects in terms of incontinence uh, weren't as bad, uh, were quite similar, if not not as quite as bad as men who were of a healthy weight but inactive. So activity definitely plays a role, um, and that's because those pelvic floor muscles are working whenever we are active. So we go to get out of our chair, those pelvic floor muscles are subconsciously doing some work. We're in the garden, um, going for a walk, pelvic floor muscles are working. And this is really, really um, <clears throat> reassuring for a lot of patients because... When we talk about weight, most people understand or realise that losing weight can take quite a while and you might only have six weeks before surgery. You can make a significant change to your activity levels in those six weeks. And often a side effect of being active will be weight loss, which is um, a win-win. Peter, Thomas mentioned their weight. Are there any other predisposed problems that can affect continence following surgery? <laughs> Uh, no, it's, it's, it's general fitness, uh, as Tom has mentioned. Um, and some, there's a small proportion of the population who have what we call uh, overactive bladders. And that's a real problem for those patients because the bladder um, is too active for their sphincters and that can uh, cause worsening of the urinary continence. And uh, that's unfortunate and... Uh, we think about 5 to 10% of the population have that. They may have been bedwetters as children or have um, urgency and frequency during their life. Uh, but, but really, I'd go back to the idea of uh, avoiding being overweight, regular, pel uh, regular exercise and uh, specifically pelvic floor exercises. And, Peter, when it comes to radiotherapy, are the side effects different? Are the different treatment options? The, the incontinence is not so much of an issue with radiotherapy in the short term. You can get burning of the bladder from radiotherapy and that causes urgency and frequency, but uh, that usually settles down after the first couple of months. In the long run, uh, after five or ten years of radiotherapy, you can get some scarring in the bladder and scarring in the sphincter muscle, which can cause onset of urinary incontinence uh, further later on. But, but incontinence is mainly a feature uh, uh, for the first 12 months after surgery. And at what point does one need immediate attention? What, what are some of the urinary side effects after surgery that require immediate attention? Uh, pain, uh, lots of bleeding uh, in the urine, um, and that pain can either be as you pass urine, you feel it in the urinary tube, it may mean if you've got an infection, um, or if you're feeling very over full and uncomfortable in the lower tummy, it may mean that you have uh, urinary retention. Um, 
fever or feeling unwell. They're similar symptoms uh, that should uh, make you seek attention with your general practitioner or uh, get in touch with your uh, prostate cancer nurse or the uh, uh, urology urologist who's looking after you. Okay, speaking of nurse, Kerry, uh, let's talk about costs. What's the cost benefit of surgery versus conservative measures to manage incontinence and what kind of funding is available? So certainly incontinence aids can become a real financial burden for men who are suffering from urinary incontinence. Uh, the Continence AIDS Payment Scheme, otherwise known as the CAPS Scheme, is an which provides payment to permanent and severe urinary incontinence. Um, men can either speak to their GP, their treating specialist, a continence nurse or continence physiotherapist, or even a prostate cancer nurse to see if they're eligible for the scheme. There is a criteria to meet eligibility. However, if they can meet that, um, currently they a year to assist with some of the, so their continence products. Uh, the CAPS scheme is tax exempt, so it won't impact any other taxable income that they may be receiving. My understanding is that some states and territories may offer state-based government-supported schemes, and if this is the case, the man to find out if this will affect his eligibility for CAPS or not. Um, but if any man is interested in, in looking further into, um, into the CAPS scheme, the forms available on the Australian Department of Health um, website Site. Um. Okay, so we've spoken about incontinence and surgery and what happens during surgery. Uh, now let's talk about after surgery. Jane, I'll start with you. So a man who has had prostate cancer surgery comes to you complaining of urinary symptoms. What is your approach? Well, um, I take a history. I, um, this is general medical history, first of all. Um, uh, out, out what medications is on, other medical problems he may have. Um, I'll ask about his prostate cancer history um, and uh, when it was and, and what treatment he's had. I'll ask about what is, and then I'll ask about the, the continence itself and what it was like before surgery and, and then I'll delve into what's happening now and uh, I'll try and get a picture of what's happening with bladder, you know, trying to get a picture of the urge or, or stress or functional or mixture. Um, I will uh, just take his bowel. <laughs> um, and I will also just find out what the impact is on this man and his partner. Um, just how much is it bothering him? Is it uh, uh, worth what his, his, his mental distress is relating to his um, incontinence? He might not have a problem, he might be really upset about it. So just to try and tease that out. So once I've got an idea of that, um, uh, I will then examine him, take his blood pressure, I will feel his tummy, um, and then I will uh, order, probably order, order some tests. I, I tend to order a urine test to check for infection. I generally do a, an ultrasound to check his kidney, urine, you know, my little diagram I did before, just see what that looks like and see if he's entering his bladder just to get a bit of a picture. Um, and then I'll refer him to a real expert, and that could, and it depends who he's really tapped into. Um, uh, who's, it may be the urologist or the prostate uh, cancer nurses, who are absolutely fantastic, or the um, pelvic floor physio. So um, we'll arrange the referral depending on who he's was already tapped into. Um, and then, because often when you get to one, they need more to get to others. It's a bit of a, a team approach, as I mentioned before. So I'll arrange the referral, and. Um, uh, I'll be there to monitor and uh, manage, uh, just keep reviewing and see how he's going um, and see how his partner's going as well, see if the partner's all right. Um, and uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll see if he wants a, a GP management plan, team care arrangement, as I think we might be talking about later. Yeah, so tell us about that GP management plan, because I'm assuming, you know, after surgery, a patient's not going to come and see you just once. And, and a few moments ago, we were just talking about all the potential costs involved too. Yeah, there's, there's two parts of the GP management plan. It's called a GP management plan or and team care arrangement. So it has two purposes. One is um, it's a way to sit down and, and speak 
the, the, the patient um, and uh, he has to have a chronic disease. And this is basically map out all the issues. It might be the prostate cancer, his continence issues, uh, might have sexual issues, he might have diabetes, he might have other things. So you sit down, you plan out what, what his current issues are, you sit down and work out what the goal, what, what are his goals, you know, you might want to get back to golf. You might want to get back to work or, or whatever. Uh, you work out the doctor's goals. You might, you know, might do a PSA at a certain time, um, check his blood pressure. So you put it all down. It's like a little map you make that patient. Then you sit down and work out, look, if these are our goals, how are we going to go about it? What, what healthcare workers do in there? Who's in your team that will help meet these goals? So you've got this document and it's like a little template for the year. Um, and then... The team care arrangement, the second part of it, that's when you invite the healthcare workers, the professionals, health workers in that plan to be part of that patient's team. So you get the, the consent, and then um, so that, that way everyone dealing with that patient knows what his goals are, who's doing what. So it's a bit of a, a coordinated approach. And as part of that, um, the, the Medicare will provide, um, I call it a voucher, but it will allow the man to have five sessions with an allied health professional five times per year um, and you get about a $50 rebate uh, on each occasion. So um, it just makes it a bit more affordable. So if continence is your own issue, then you might divide them up between the physio or the physiotherapist. Um, but if he's got, you know, podiatrists and other things, you then have to sort of spread them out and work out how you're going to allocate each voucher. That's a way they can get some funding and some, and also coordination of care. Kerry, you mentioned earlier about, um, I guess, financial assistance for AIDS, but we didn't really go into detail about what types of AIDS can be used to manage moderate and severe leakage. What are they? Yeah, so, Ricardo, there's lots of AIDS out there to help. Um, some clinical sort of support for this, I think it's important. So... Uh, continence advisors, continence physiotherapists or another suitable health professional um, can do an assessment with the man. That can really help um, them choose appropriate continence products that are specific to, to what they need. Uh, also, men have the option to call the National Continence Helpline, uh, 1800 33 and um, they'll be able to access it, someone at the other end of that line who can help sort of steer them in the right direction. Uh, obviously, the, the main aid that men tend to use are pads. Um, so male continence pads are designed to absorb urine away from the surface of the pad and into the base. Uh, and the materials that they're made of are also designed to reduce odour. There's all different sizes and shapes to pads depending on what the man needs. Some pads work um, by being placed in a supportive pair of underwear um, the sticky adhesive on the back holds the pad. They're designed in a pant look, and these styles tend to have a larger holding capacity than those that sit in underwear. It's really important that obviously the man feels relatively comfortable in, and one that can last a few hours before he needs to change it. Uh, there's lots of different brands of men's. On it. Um, and a lot of these companies provide sample packs for men to use. And I really encourage men to try and access this, often through the links um, on their websites. And um, then they're able to try different size capacity pads. They even be able to work out themselves. Uh, pads are uh, really easy to find. Uh, supermarkets chemists, medical supply stores and online healthcare stores all stock male pads. Uh, if they're not keen on pads or they want to try a different aid, uh, Eurodomes or external sheets um, are an option for some men. The shaft of the penis it has an end which attaches um, to a drainage bag, normally a, a leg bag. And that leg bag is strapped uh, onto the leg and worn underneath clothing, so it's well concealed. Uh, Eurodomes are a good option for men um, who have quite a, a high amount of leakage. Uh, they may want a different alternative to wearing a large pad. Uh, sometimes if they've got limited access in getting to a toilet, um, 
A lot of men put them on overnight because um, they're worried about the amount of leakage that might occur and into the bed. Um, so some men opt to use a urodome uh, with a drainage bag overnight. They're certainly not for everyone and you do need some clinical sort of support and help if you're interested or, or considering urodomes because they're best to be fitted by um, a healthcare professional so that you have the correct size. Um, they're difficult to find. You won't find them in supermarkets. They're very limited in chemists, but certainly medical supplies and stores have them and are able to, um, to send them out. Kerry, you mentioned their um, pads, and it might be a good time for um, me to tell our viewers that Tenor is a, a major partner of the uh, PCFA. Um, they make incontinence products, and the company is providing uh, free prostate kits to those watching this webcast. So just keep an eye out for an email from the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia after this webcast. Uh, it'll have some details about how to access those free prostate um, kits along with a discount code for other products. So that'll come in an email later on after this uh, webcast. Uh, we've got a few more minutes. Jane, maybe very quickly, you know, we've spoken about different types of AIDS. What about medications? Uh, the main medications um, that I've been using for is one of the big, uh, I think it's a trade name, but I'm not very good at saying the actual proper name. Um, it's Bessie Care and uh, Betmega. And be this is for the um, urge incontinence, where that, uh, you know, the um, urge to go quickly, the irritable bladder. So it just, these medications work in different ways to try and just relax the bladder and try and reduce that urge and uh, they can be very helpful. They're the main medications. Thomas, the, the, the other thing we probably haven't really mentioned, and we've got maybe a, a minute and a little bit for you, is how incontinence can impact one's sex life and one, what are some of the uh, practical solutions to make both parties feel more comfortable? Yeah, so Ricardo, um, <coughs> climacteria is a, is a big problem. So that is the leaking of urine um, during orgasm. So a lot of men don't realise that they can still orgasm after prostate surgery, um, but it should be dry because, as Jane said earlier, the prostate produces the fluid most of the fluid for the ejaculate. So climacteria is the leaking of urine during orgasm, which can obviously bother, be bothersome for both parties. Um, it, can, it can range in uh, how bothersome it is um, and, and the, how, and how much leakage there is. So for some men, it's simply managed just by voiding um, before before sexual intercourse, other men it may be involved using using a condom to catch some uh, some leakage, and then it kind of progresses from there. So um, into some medications, as Jane mentioned, or as Peter mentioned earlier, potentially some men will will have surgery just for that uh, side effect of surgery. They might be dry day to day, but they they leak during orgasm. We've got a couple of final minutes, um, but there's one major issue that we should probably address right now that's relevant to the, I guess, uh, health environment that we're in. And, and I might ask this to both uh, Peter and Jane. Peter, maybe to you first. We are in a global health pandemic, COVID-19. You know, we're being told not to leave the house if we don't need to. If one does have these issues, do they still see their doctor? Well, I think it, you have to take a balanced approach. If it's really causing a lot of distress, uh, particularly uh, also if you're getting pain and discomfort, you must go and see your doctor, talk to your GP, uh, talk to your urologist. I know at a personal level, we've been doing a lot of telephone consultation and supporting our patients by phone as much as we can. Uh, so the answer is if you're really distressed, if you're having pain, bleeding or rashes, you you should go and seek help. There's no doubt about that. And Jane, maybe to you too, since you're often the, the first port of call being the GP, what kind of reassurances can you give to patients who are worried about venturing outside in this type of health environment that they will be safe if they need to see a GP physically and, and then what are the other options to, to seek advice? Well, it, it is important to seek advice, number one. Number two, um, uh, how we go about it is uh, we do telephone consultations first to get as much history over the phone, and a lot of problems can be sorted out over the phone. 
But if um, if the patient needs to be seen, well, uh, we'll definitely see them and we will make, we will see them so long as the patient or the doctor or the staff do not have a cough, cold, fever or any sort of uh, respiratory symptoms. So if there are any respiratory symptoms, keep away. But assuming everyone's well, um, we will ask you to come to the surgery at an allocated time. We'll take as much history in a separated, uh, you know, away from the face-to-face -face interaction. And then um, we can definitely examine you. I'm, I'm seeing a man next week to examine him. I've taken all the history. I'll examine him and then he can go to another room. I can ring him with any further um, uh, in instructions or investigations we need to do. But we're trying to restrict the, the amount of face-to-face uh, contact that we have, the, the close contact. That way we reduce the risk of any transmission. But the risk is low and we're doing all our best we can and um, and if patients need to be seen and we are making provisions for that. Okay, uh, Peter, I might give you the last word if that's okay. I, I guess this is a very um, stressful issue for many men to, to deal with. A lot of, a lot, I guess, find it hard to talk about or think of the worst case scenario. But can you leave us with maybe some sort of optimistic feeling about one that does have to go through this, that does have to go through surgery, that um, things will be all right? Yes, as I mentioned earlier, Ricardo, uh, don't ever forget, uh, gentlemen and families, that whilst surgeons cut, patients heal. Time is a great healer and there are plenty of solutions out there. Don't don't um, hide away and, and, and feel that there's not a lot of help available. Just on that point, everyone does get better, but on that point, don't be embarrassed or ashamed if you are feeling depressed or down uh, after surgery or after diagnosis. That's common, that's expected. We're here to support you, the prostate cancer nurses, PCFA, your GP, uh, uh, your surgeons, physios. We're all there to help you get through this. And believe you me, after 12 or 18 months, uh, hopefully sooner for some, you will be better. And prostate cancer is curable when found early. So uh, be optimistic, be happy. Great way to end. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our panel, Dr Peter Heathcote, Dr Jane Crow, Thomas Harris and Kerry Sontoro. I think they were um, really fantastic and quite insightful. That does wrap up our Ask the Experts uh, webcast, which was proudly sponsored by Astellis. Uh, thank you to our panel once again for joining us online as we navigate this COVID-19 environment and social distancing online. Uh, there may have been some technical difficulties, but of course uh, we got the, the general gist. There is a, a lot of resources and information on the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia website. Just head there for more details. If you join the webcast late or want to re-watch it at a later date, it will be uploaded on the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia website. Uh, soon it will be on the uh, video section of the online community. Just make sure you keep an eye on the emails that come out from the PCFA as to when it will be online. I'm Ricardo Gonsalves. Thank you everyone for joining and tuning in.